In much of old Christian Europe, a new symbol now expresses the official idealism of the state. For centuries, the people of Russia lived surrounded by Christian images. Now they have new icons for old. Holy Russia became the first country in the world to make it an article of faith that God does not exist. When Russia fell to Marxist revolutionaries, it was part of a long continuing struggle between Christian monarchs on the right and atheist republicans on the left. Lenin's victory was the first clear win for the left. When the tricolor flies on July the 14th at the Arc de Triomphe, Paris commemorates the beginning of the French Revolution. It was then that revolution and atheism first went hand in hand. In the Paris of that time, the church was seen as an ally of the corrupt ruling class. In 1793, all the churches in the city were closed. In that same year, there came the revolution's most extreme act of disrespect to the Christian God. His anointed ruler, Louis XVI, was guillotined, and his head held out like a trophy to the people of Paris. And soon an upstart Corsican climbed into his place. For ten impertinent years, he called himself the Emperor Napoleon. That was how events seemed to the French royal family. And when they came back to Paris, after the fall of Napoleon, they set about restoring a Christian, royalist France. One of the first things they did was to look for the body of the guillotined king. And they found it, on this site, buried in a common grave in Quickline. And so it was here that a monument was put up by his brother, now himself king as Louis XVIII. He called it a chapelle expiatoire, a chapel to expiate not only the murder of his brother, but all the unchristian horrors of the revolution. Soon there was a more majestic setting for the Christian royalist reaction. At Reims, another king of France was to be crowned with all the splendor of a medieval ceremony. People are dwarfed by the great facade of this cathedral, and that was precisely the point that Charles X was making when he had himself crowned here. He was reasserting the old semi-divine idea of kingship. It was his answer to the impertinence of both revolution and atheism. When he organized a ceremony which deliberately brought to mind the romance and splendor of the Middle Ages, the king was claiming his place in an unbreakable chain of Christian authority, claiming God's special favor for the head that wears the crown. Such a medieval pageant was calculated to drive people to extremes. The supporters of the king were delighted. To his opponents, it all seemed totally ludicrous. Soon, Charles was passing laws which were even more divisive. Everything was done to favor the clergy and the nobility. And a new penalty was decreed for blasphemy, death. Well, this was no way to avoid a future revolution. In 1848, a revolution swept away the French monarchy for the second time. There were revolutions against many of the Christian kings of Europe that summer. The Pope even had to flee from Rome. And these upheavals were watched with special interest by two young Germans, who had published in that same year the Manifesto of the Communist Party, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Its opening words were to become famous. A spectre is haunting Europe, the spectre of communism. All the powers of old Europe have entered into a holy alliance to exorcise this spectre. Of the two authors, it was Engels who had experience of industrial life. He worked in a textile firm which was owned by his father in Manchester. This was the way the owners liked to imagine the factories which brought them their wealth. But Engels saw the factories for himself. And when he was only 24, he wrote a book about the real conditions of the working class in industrial England. He described how he took a rich merchant on a tour of industrial Manchester. I once went into Manchester with a member of the English bourgeoisie and spoke to him of the bad and wholesome method of building, the frightful condition of the working people's quarters, and asserted that I'd never seen so ill-built a city. The man listened quietly to the end and said at the corner where we parted, and yet there is a great deal of money made here. Good morning, sir. Money is the god of this world. 
the bourgeois takes the proletarian's money from him and so makes a practical atheist of him. Karl Marx also spent most of his working life in England. In France or Germany, he'd have been arrested as a revolutionary. But in London, there was no political censor. Here, Marx was free to develop his ideas. And here, there was plenty of evidence to support a theory of class warfare. At the heart of Britain's great empire, in the world's first industrialized country, an entire class seemed to be sealed off in hopeless poverty. Christian England did more than tolerate the atheist Karl Marx. It even provided him with the perfect place in which to do his work. Under another great dome, that of the reading room at the British Museum, Marx hatched out the first effective political system to do without God. The walls of the library are lined with reference books, and Marx liked to sit as near to them as he could. In fact, the tradition is that this very desk, 07, was his favorite seat. Marxism and Christianity are now thought of as the great rivals. But Marx himself regarded religion as a comparatively unimportant matter. He began with the premise, which certainly wasn't new with him, that instead of God creating man, man had invented God. And he saw the church as the natural ally, first of feudal society, and then of the capitalist state. And therefore as something which socialism in its turn would sweep away. But he was surprisingly calm about individual people who believed in God because he insisted that religion was in no way the cause of the world's troubles. It was their result. The famous phrase, religion is the opium of the people, suggests that he thought of it as some dangerous drug foisted upon the masses. But the full passage shows that he saw it more as a consolation for the deprived, even quite a precious one. He writes about it in an almost misty vein. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. To call on them to give up their illusions about their condition is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions. As it turned out, the first people to be called on to give up their illusions were precisely those who suffered the worst conditions, the people of holy Russia. Marx had expected the revolution to occur in an industrial country. Instead, during the upheaval of the First World War, Marxist revolutionaries were able to seize power in this backward peasant empire, long dominated by the old Christian alliance of throne and altar, emperor and patriarch. Naturally, the new government seized the very extensive properties of the church. As with Henry VIII and the English monasteries, there was a sound economic reason for that too. Equally naturally, they set about undermining the popular religion. To give one tiny example, a priest in Georgia told a story of how a group of hungry schoolchildren were told to ask God for their daily bread. Three times they asked, nothing happened. Then they were told to make the same request to Lenin. And lo and behold, round the corner there came a truck full of food. In shaping this first supposedly godless state, Lenin adapted the ideas of Marx and gave a harsher twist to Marx's phrase about religion. Religion is the opium of the people. It is a kind of spiritual gin 
in which the slaves of capital drown their human shape. Every idea of God is unutterable vileness, vileness of the most dangerous kind, contagion of the most abominable kind. All modern religions and churches, all religious organizations, Marxism always regards as organs of bourgeois reaction, serving to defend exploitation and to stupefy the working class. Sixty years after the revolution, and in spite of Lenin's views, the monastery at Zagorsk, not far from Moscow, is still a very Christian place. The annual feast day of the founder, St. Sergius, is one of the greatest church celebrations in the whole of Russia. On such a day, it's hard to believe that the revolution happened. Of the many bishops at this great ceremony, one of the most senior was the head of the Moscow Patriarchate, Metropolitan Alexei. The church has existed for 59 years under the new social conditions. During this time, more than one generation has followed another. Nevertheless, the faithful still fill our churches. 
We can note with satisfaction the active part played by our worshippers in the life of the church. One cannot, of course, deny that there is a process of secularization, both in the East and in the West, and that there is a definite movement away from the church. But I would think that this process has been more noticeable in the West in recent times. Speaking on behalf of the Russian Orthodox Church, I see no cause for alarm for its future, and I look to the future with confidence. A feast day at Zagorsk is untypical. From here, Metropolitan Alexei will return to the practical problems facing all Russian bishops since the revolution. How to exist in a state which regards God as superstition. Communist Russia has made strenuous efforts over the years to discourage Christianity. Christians were persecuted by Lenin, whose tomb beneath the Kremlin walls is the shrine recommended by the state for veneration. They were persecuted by Stalin and even by Khrushchev. Yet Christianity persisted. Now it seems the state may regard full churches as useful proof that freedom of worship, guaranteed by the law, is indeed a reality. The legal position in Russia is defined by Article 124 of the Constitution. It says, the freedom of religious worship and the freedom of anti-religious propaganda is acknowledged to all citizens. It's a strange phrase, but it means exactly what it says. Anyone may worship any god within any four walls which have been licensed for religious worship. But the right to public propaganda is reserved for those who say there is no god. I speak for the Council for Religious Affairs, which comes under the Council of Ministers of the USSR. It is a department of state created to ensure the freedom of conscience in our country and to enforce Soviet law relating to religious denominations. In so far as the attitude of the Communist Party to religious ideology is concerned, the party regards religious ideology as unscientific and takes appropriate work of enlightenment among the population. At the same time, the Communist Party is resolutely opposed to any disciplinary or repressive measures whatsoever, directed against the Church and its members. Even if the state will not allow Christian propaganda today, it lovingly restores the Christian propaganda of past centuries. But this is seen only as evidence of Russia's historic past. Atheists here, as anywhere else, will be moved by the beauty of such a church, a memorial to the genius of those who built it, even if no longer to the God for whom it was built. Russians created this. There lies the point and the pride. Not all such buildings can be given the expensive attention of the restorers. Many countries now face the problem of what to do with unused churches. And Russia is not alone in using them for strictly practical purposes. When a lorry turns into this ancient monastery today, it is delivering materials to a working factory. But this monastery has been given a use which would be approved of anywhere. It houses a collection of national treasures. Christian icons. The museum is now named after one of Russia's greatest painters, Andrei Rublev, who in the 15th century became a monk, first at the monastery of Zagorsk, and then in this one at Moscow. In this same monastery, the slow, patient work of restoring the icons goes on. Icons were painted as far more than objects of art. They were above all objects of devotion. And in the homes of many people in Russia today, icons still fulfill that ancient role. Here, the old Russian Orthodox traditions continue. This house is in a small village near Moscow, Volokolamsk. In the countryside, Christianity still has its strongest hold. 
It's been calculated that some 40 million people, that's one out of every six, still go to church in the Soviet Union. Holy Russia is still holy, whatever the official theories about God. In many ways, life in a Russian village goes on much as it always did. But this Orthodox priest is very different from a minority of Protestant Christians who also live in the Soviet Union. Unlike them, he doesn't go in for active propaganda, so he doesn't break the law and end up in jail. The Russian Orthodox Church may be criticized for this by evangelical Christians, but then it has a long tradition of being politically passive. It can exist almost as well under a commissar as under a czar. It remains ancient, attractive, gentle, and as far as the state is concerned, relatively harmless. Within Russia's new empire, Eastern Europe, only Poland is more Christian than Russia herself. When you look from a distance at Warsaw, it's the cathedral that catches the eye. It's been rebuilt down to the smallest detail, exactly as it was before the war. And the same is true of every other building in the old part of Warsaw. For no attempt to suppress the spirit of Poland was more ruthless than that of Nazi Germany. In 1944, Warsaw was systematically destroyed. In rebuilding Warsaw, the Poles gave their answer. An answer as defiantly Polish as the red and white of the country's flag, and as defiantly Polish as the Roman Catholic Church. Warsaw's churches were reconstructed with the same care as any other building, together with their memorials to national heroes, such as Chopin and the leader of the wartime government in exile, General Sikorsky. Surprisingly, the churches were reconstructed under a communist government. The Russian army had helped to drive out the Germans, but there was no one to drive out the Russians. And the palace of culture, which Stalin presented to Warsaw, symbolized a new domination as well as a new ideology. Modern city life, even without an atheist government, leads in most places to a drastic decrease in church going. Here it hasn't. And when new churches are built today, they are part of a long Polish tradition, a rejection of ideas imposed from outside. Naturally, the Marxist government, well aware of the implication, is uneasy about a rival creed to which people are willing to devote much of their money and their time. Applications to build churches are discouraged. Only a very small proportion get the go-ahead. 
But all over Poland, churches are being built. And they're full even before they're finished. In this one in Warsaw, a projector flashes the words of the hymn onto a screen, avoiding the need for vast quantities of hymn books. During the last war, the Roman Catholic priests increased their already high standing in Poland because of their courage and leadership among the almost unbelievable horrors which overtook these people. One out of every five Poles died during the Second World War. But only a fraction of those, about 10%, died from bombs or shells. The rest were victims of the attempt by one nation to wipe out all recognizable traces of another casualties of mass executions and of concentration camps. No wonder the population of Poland today is unusually young. No wonder the church here has an appeal more compulsive than Christianity can provide in most Western countries today. This is a scene as different from the elderly peasant congregations of Russia as it is from the sparse congregations of Western Europe. Here is the raw material of a standard communist poster, the heroic worker at the forge, fashioning the socialist future. So the hammer takes its place beside the sickle. This great complex of factories was created from scratch in the countryside. It was to be a symbol of the new socialist Poland, and it was named accordingly, the Steelworks of Lenin. Nova Huta, new steelworks, is the name of the town where the workers live. This was to be the ideal socialist city. In the traditional way of such places, the morning air is filled with Marxist music. Well before the Russian Revolution, in the year 1912, Lenin visited this part of Poland. The 65th anniversary of his visit in 1977 provides the state with the perfect occasion for its own kind of ceremony, honoring one of the great founders of the faith. Communism can be seen as the world's newest religion, with productivity high among its articles of faith. The city of Nova Huta was built with no provision for a church, so the Christians living here took matters into their own hands. They built this vast church, 
which after 10 years opened its doors in 1977. Saturday afternoon is a time for weddings, here like anywhere else. And the young couples are married with something of the speed and efficiency of a production line. While one pair kneel at the altar, the next bride and groom are awaiting their turn. Sunday is the day for another even more crowded Christian ceremony in the crypt of the church. The Christians here have a productivity record of which Nova Huta should be proud. And the church rises to the occasion with a magnificent multiple baptism. The Christians built their church in a town of some 200,000 people, nearly all of whom depend on the steelworks. People come to Nova Huta because the wages are high and there's plenty of modern housing. Socialism in that respect has delivered what it promised. In the sense that Marx had in mind, these people have been freed from living conditions that required the consolation of spiritual illusions. But that change has not caused them to give up their illusions. The father of this family works an eight-hour shift in the foundry. But every day, either before or after work, he puts in a few hours on Nova Huta's new church. This church has been paid for entirely with the money of those who use it. Part of the building work was done by the members of the congregation. And this is not the only church which is now being built in Nova Huta. A second has already been begun elsewhere in the town. A priest in the Polish community expects and gets a response from his parishioners, such as a priest in the West can only pray for. And it's the same with education. This is the age at which Christianity and communism first struggle for people's minds. Panie Głośno, Pan Jezus? Spotykam się w Z ludźmi się spotykam właśnie. Dlatego teraz jak przychodzimy tam... This crowded class is like a Sunday school, except that it happens twice as often. On two evenings a week, after official school hours are over, and the theories of Marx and Lenin have been duly memorized, the children come for Christian instruction from the priest. Zamienił wodę w wino. The crowning moment of the week in Nova Huta's new church is Sunday Mass. Ten Masses are held every Sunday, each one as crowded as this. Whatever difficulties the future may hold for Christians in this officially atheist country, the older people here have memories incomparably worse. Auschwitz was near here. And one chapel in the church is dedicated to a national hero, Maximilian Kolbe, a Catholic priest who gave his life in Auschwitz in the place of another prisoner who was father of a family. The story of Kolbe, more than any other, links the Polish church with the country's long experience of suffering. 
But suffering here has led to defiance. The traditional image of the Virgin Mary with the body of her dead son is soft and mournful. Here, sorrow has been turned to strength. Poland has unique reasons for the strength of its Roman Catholic faith. But the people of Nowohuta do provide a very powerful image of the number of active Christians in at least one country that is officially communist. On the other hand, as the headlines keep mentioning, there is a surprising number of communists in the country which is the very center of Roman Catholicism, Italy. San Gimignano in Tuscany is perhaps the most perfectly preserved small medieval Italian town, a jewel from Europe's Christian past. When its famous walls and towers were built in the Middle Ages, there had been bitter struggles as to whether this town should be governed by a nearby bishop or by the people themselves. But both parties then were devout Christians. God was certain to be on the winning side. Today, this is no longer so. For the last 30 years, there has been an ideological split in this little community. It's a split closely observed by St. Gimignano himself, a bishop who saved the town from invading barbarians in the fourth century. Today, under his gaze, the communist mayor meets with his small executive committee, all of them communists. In this town, like many others in Italy, their party has won every local election since the war. Compared to the extraordinarily corrupt ways of Christian politicians in Italy, it's the Communist Party, for many people, which has established a reputation for honesty, once thought of as a Christian virtue. It's the old problem of power. When the priest and his Catholic friends go about their business in San Gimignano, they're not much threatened by the politics of the mayor at this local level. Neither priest nor mayor can do much to frustrate the plans of the other. It's on a higher national level that the battle for power becomes bitter. And inevitably, whatever his own political views, the priest is likely to be identified with the Roman Catholic Party that has run Italy ever since the war. In 30 years, there have been more than 30 governments in Italy, all of them Christian Democrat. With a record like that, and with the general anarchy of Italy today, it isn't hard for the communists to seem the party of idealism. When the priest visits the prison at San Gimignano, he comes to a place where Italy's problems are all too plain. Some people wait in jail for up to 18 months before their case is even heard. Others, with better connections, go free. And this in a country whose government is, specifically, Christian. There are dangers for any idealistic creed once it wins real power. But they are dangers which the communists in Italy haven't yet had to face, though they may now be on the verge of doing so. For the moment, they have only the easier task of trying to straighten out ancient muddles and injustices at a local level. On this occasion, the mayor of San Gimignano is visiting a vineyard which belongs to an absentee landlord. He comes to discuss working conditions with the foreman and the laborers and to lay plans for a future cooperative. Christianity too has always made vaguely threatening noises against the rich and has claimed to see special merit in the poor. But the Christian priest has warned the rich only of punishments far ahead while advising the poor to wait for a reward in heaven.
For the communists, there is only a tactical merit in waiting, and the shorter the wait, the better. As a message, it has certain advantages. Each of the two ideologies is seen at its best at this intimate level, and in a position of influence rather than power. And both of them, after acquiring absolute power, have shown themselves capable of equal barbarities. The communist ideas, which seem liberating here in Italy, have been turned in communist countries into mental straitjackets. And so it was at one time with Christianity. Christian monks and priests once taught Europe almost all that it knew. And hard though it is to imagine today in the peaceful cloisters of San Gimignano, Christian bishops and kings sent to the stake those heretics who didn't repeat their lessons in the approved fashion. Tutti insieme, nel nome del Padre, del Figlio e dello Spirito Santo, Amen. Padre nostro che sei nei cieli, sia santificato il tuo nome, venga il tuo regno, sia fatta la tua volontà, come in cielo fosse in terra. Give me a child until he is seven, and I will show you the man. It's a principle both the Christians and the communists agree upon. In many offices in Italy that look like this, a bribe is the price of action. Here it's not needed. At this stage of the game, it's the communists who make political capital out of the Christian virtues. <laughs> This rather sinister looking ceremony is being carried out by the local branch of the Misericordia. It's a charitable organization which was founded in the 13th century to provide porters who would carry the sick to hospital. Today there are nearly 500 branches of the Misericordia in Tuscany and more than a quarter of a million members. Each member, apart from paying a subscription, must vow to devote at least one hour a week for life to work of practical charity, which is still mainly in the medical field. This particular ceremony is the funeral of one of the members. When one of the society's ambulances sets out to answer a call for help, the original charitable function of the Misericordia has been very precisely updated into the 20th century. 700 years ago, this charity was providing porters to carry sick people to hospital. Except that the porter's rough stretcher has now become an expensive and more comfortable ambulance, the act of Christian mercy is still exactly the same. <laughs> One of the local organizations with which the Misericordia cooperates is the welfare center set up by the communist mayor. Increasingly, the government in modern countries has taken over the old tasks of Christian charity. The classic situations that used to call for charity are now precisely the concerns of the welfare state. Sickness, old age, homelessness, unemployment. 
There are subjects on which the Misericordia would disagree with the people who run this centre. Contraception, for example. But there are other non-controversial and equally urgent needs. Many people in Italy are not covered by any welfare scheme. And here the objects of Christian and of communist charity coincide. When someone sets off to visit an old lady, the ideology behind the visit seems unimportant. The motto of the Misericordia is, may your reward come from God. It may well be that the mayor's motto, when he sends out a visitor, is something more like, may my reward come at the next election. But in practice, only a cynic on either side would be thinking of reward in such a situation. The simple fact now, as in centuries past, is that many old people need help. And no doubt the old lady herself doesn't much care about the precise beliefs of her friendly visitor. In a small place like San Gimignano, the famous battle lines of the outside world, Christian against communist, soon become blurred. If Italy goes communist, it will certainly not cease to be Christian. The Christian Gospels have a way of outbidding each new ideology. They contained in advance the highest creed of our secular society. All you need is love. And they contain the best element in communism, the theme of sharing. Today, even Rome, the eternal city, has a communist mayor. It was here that we began these programs. There were Christians living in this city even at the time the New Testament was written. Yet the Christians described in the New Testament were themselves communists of a kind, sharing their possessions. What would they have made of all this? What would they have thought of the Christianity of emperors and kings and popes? They might be almost as shocked by the worldliness of later Christians as by the ungodliness of later communists. And yet, was the way of the early Christians the only truly Christian way, as has often been suggested? When planning this series of programs, I reread the New Testament straight through as if it were the book of some unknown religion. And I find it impossible to believe that someone coming to it for the first time would find any clear impression of what Christ or Christianity had stood for. He could choose from its sayings and its contradictory parables almost any message he liked. And Christians over the centuries have done precisely that. I was able to recognize all the different Christianities that 20 centuries have produced. Verses about Christ the King for the imperial Christians, pain and suffering for the Middle Ages, quietness, humility for those who prefer that kind of religion, a note of radical protest for the revolutionaries, and even the apocalypse for people who are every day expecting the end of the world. The ability to adapt is what makes for survival, and when it comes to survival, Christianity has certainly proved itself one of the fittest. The variety of Christians in the world today are like a record of the complex evolution of their faith. One thing all Christians can agree upon, in the beginning, was the word, but the word required interpretation. Mm -hmm. 